All right, glory to God. Yes, that's wonderful. I tell you, you know, it, it's amazing how when you sing those songs, uh, and we've done, we've done many of them uh, many times because they bless us so much and they, they're you know, expressions of what we want to say to the Lord. But uh, sometimes you just noticed certain words in there that uh, you've been singing them all along, but maybe you haven't totally noticed what they were saying. And uh, that song is just filled with some tremendously good theology. I'm telling you about uh, the Lord moving when we move and, uh, and the Lord filling the empty spaces in, in, in our lives and the expectations and all of those things. It's just, it's just amazing. Sometimes that just, I just see that and it touches my life. We're in a series, <clears throat> started last week, on uh, the transformed mind. And, of course, uh, what we're talking about is the fact that when you come to Christ, uh, your mind has to change. And it needs to change because before you get saved, you don't have the mind of Christ. No one, before they get saved, no one has the mind of Christ. You have a mind of the world. You think like the world thinks. You experience things like the world experiences things. And so, in order for your life to become reflective of Christ, obviously, you have to change in the way you think and the way you relate and the way you understand things. And how do you go about changing your mind? Well, the key scripture, key passage to this, is what the Apostle Paul shares with us in Romans chapter 12, the first two verses. Most of us that were brought up anywhere near church, these verses are very familiar to us and they're used all the time, but they're tremendously revolutionary in understanding that this is how God goes about changing our mind, thereby everything about our, our lives. And here, here's Romans 12, one and two. This is kind of the key passage for this whole series. This is what it bounces off of really. And and, and here it is. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. And that word conformed is our word from which we get schematic. So if we are conformed to this world, then we are identical to this world. We think identically to this world. Folks, don't, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the more like Christ my mind becomes, the clearer God's will becomes to me. When I first get saved and my mind is in the first process of transformation, I can see, what it, I can see the, the good will of God. And then as my mind becomes more mature like Christ, I can see the acceptable will of God. But then as I become even more mature in my life and my mind is, is, is transformed in deeper ways, the deeper the transformation, the greater the discernment. And and I can see the perfect will of God. So this is, a, this is crucial to our life. The Apostle Paul is saying, if you're gonna give your body to God and you're gonna be a living sacrifice for him, then you can't think the way the world thinks. You're gonna have to learn a new way of thinking. Your mind must be transformed, metamorpho is the Greek word from which we get metamorphosis, obviously, which means a total change. And the emblem, and I mentioned it last week, or the logo for transformation would be a butterfly. You see it uh, everywhere. And what, what happens with a butterfly? Well, he goes in a cocoon as a caterpillar, and when he comes out, he's a butterfly. But what's changed about him? Well, everything has changed. His whole structure has changed. Nothing about his former self is the same. When he emerges from that cocoon, he has been totally transformed. And that's what the Lord says is our life is about and that our, our mind is the key to transforming everything in our life and becoming what Christ had in mind when he created us. So with, with that little introduction in mind, I, I wanna give you three truths, 
today. Of course, obviously, three. Uh, it seems like all spiritual things come in threes, but here we go with three transforming truths that we need to recognize about our mind being changed. All right, here they are. Here's the first one. Number one, your mind is the battlefield of good and evil. First thing you need to understand, first truth you need to see is that your mind is a battlefield between good and evil. And here's the scripture that tells us this, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse three, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not of the flesh, in other words, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we don't, although we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. So even though we're living in the flesh in this world, this world is made up, it consists of things that are, that are, that are physically um, dynamic around us. So we live in this world, but we're not fighting a war that's in this world. We're fighting an, an, an invisible war that goes on all around us. And God has given us weapons to fight this war with. And it's a good thing because we can't see this war going on. So we're having to, we're having to fight with an enemy that we can't see, that we can't physically assault or physically manage in this invisible spiritual war that goes on around us. But God says, in order for you to win this war, you're going to have to engage in the war. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to join the fight. You're going to have to show up. You have a part in this. This is not just something that God does for us. But he gives us these weapons. And then goes on in verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now, in, any of you that have been in teachings concerning spiritual battles, spiritual warfare is what we used to call it, you've uh, heard s certain terms uh, over and over again, and one of those terms would be strongholds. So what is a stronghold? Well, a stronghold could be described as a, a, a mental, like a mental fortress. If you can picture a mental fortress where the devil protects himself from being discovered and being dealt with. And, and it could be any kind of mental fortress. Uh, many lives are ruled by fear, fear is a stronghold. Every time something comes up that is fear producing, the enemy grabs hold of that and, and pushes it and your life is controlled by fear or jealousy or unforgiveness or anger or depression or lust or whatever stronghold might be there that the enemy hides in to protect himself from being uh, cast out of our life. So one of the words in this spiritual vocabulary, this spiritual warfare vocabulary is a stronghold. There's another word that's used quite often and it's the word bondage, that people are in bondage to things. Well, you can think of a bondage as like a house of thoughts uh, would be a good way to picture it in your mind, that when thoughts are, are linked together and, and, and they all uh, have an interaction with each other, those thoughts all go together to form uh, what is called a, a bondage because every single issue in our life is a thought issue. I don't know if you've noticed a, a commercial lately on TV, and I can't even remember the name of the product now, but it, 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 it interests me because it was different. And it was a, it was a, it's a diet plan but it's not, uh, it doesn't involve food, it doesn't involve uh, patterns of eating and so forth. What it's about is it, it is a teaching about why we want to eat incorrectly, why we want to eat all the time. And it teaches you about what's going on mentally that causes us to uh, eat and overeat and, and become out of shape. And I thought, that, that's, I've never heard, I mean, that's the first time I've ever heard that. And, and they say that it works really well. I, I have no idea. But my point is that every issue in our life is a thought issue. 
our eating habits, our thought issues, drinking habits, our thought issues, drug problems, thought issues, gambling problems, thought issues, lust problems. Just name any, anything in our life that is an issue in our life, and it is a thought issue. And if you change the thought, then you change your life. So when you come to Christ, when you get saved, all of us have multiple strongholds in our life. The enemy has been controlling our life through certain areas because no one is born saved. Everyone is born lost. And we're born into a world that is corrupt. So whether it's the iniquities of your family or the, or the carnality of your relationships or just the pure old sinfulness of your own thoughts, all of us develop strongholds in our life. And these strongholds have been built in our life through disappointment, through fear, through rejection, through hurt, through failure. I mean, just name your poison. These issues that have been built in our life blend together to become fortresses of thought that make it very difficult for us to believe that God can really work in our life and that our lives can be something b besides a, a scarred existence or a, or a, or a, 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 a reproach or, or, or that God can actually cleanse our life. Uh, have you ever talked to anyone about, about Christ and, it, and you just see a look in their eye and it's like they don't, they don't even understand what you're talking about. And it's clear that they just cannot grasp the fact that God could do this kind of stuff in their life. That they just find it very difficult to believe that all of their sin, that God could just simply wash and make it clean and forgive it and, wa and walk away from it and not hold it against you and post a no fishing sign, you know, and, and never to be brought up again. Why is that? It's because strongholds have been built in all of our lives, before we come to Christ especially, that group together and make it very difficult for the truth of God to get through those strongholds and make a difference in our life. But God has, has weapons that are mighty that will pull down these strongholds. In verse five, it says, casting down arguments. Well, these bondages that we have, these, this, this house of thoughts that have been built in the bad times in our life, uh, when we hear the truth of God, immediately when we hear the truth of God, the argument starts. Now, if you want to see the first argument, you'll see, the happen, you'll see it happen with the first people that ever existed on this earth. After the first command that God gave the first people that ever lived on this earth, an argument immediately came from the enemy. Let's read it in Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more cunning, stealthy, than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Immediately, an argument begins, arguing against the word of God. God said, don't eat of it. The day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And Satan said, you're not going to die. That's ridiculous. Why did he tell you that? And the argument begins. Now, did, 
what did what did it, what did the argument do for them? What did what did it help them? Uh, did it make them better? Uh, did it take them to a better place? No, it killed them because the moment they ate of the fruit that God had forbid them from, their bodies began to die. Now it took eight or nine hundred years for them to completely die, but they would have never died had they obeyed God. But the moment they ate of the fruit, they began to, uh, to die immediately. Their cells began to deteriorate. Their body began to deteriorate. Their mind began to deteriorate. And everything began to roll down because they disobeyed God in the argument that Satan put forth. And they lost the glory of God, according to Romans 10, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So... For, all, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Satan has only one purpose in our life, and that is he doesn't want us to know God. And he doesn't care what it is that keeps us from knowing God. We don't have to be laying in a ditch somewhere or in some jail cell or doing some horrible thing. I mean, fear, lust, worry, doubt, depression, discouragement, jealousy, envy. I mean, whatever it is, it doesn't matter to him. He doesn't care what it is that keeps us from God. He just wants to put some high thing in our mind that will occupy our mind and become the focus of our mind so that we'll get distracted from knowing God and reading his word and praying and being involved in church and, 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 and fulfilling what God's purpose is in our life. So the weapons that the Lord gives us, the battlefield of good and evil is, is right here. This is where the battle is fought. And God has given us great weapons that will remove all of these focuses that are, are so devastating to us, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Look, bringing every thought into captivity. Do you realize that every thought that you don't bring into captivity brings you into captivity? It ends up controlling you. Captivity, and, and the Greek word, it's not important you remember, but it's eikmal tizo, which simply means... Uh, uh, to bring at spear point or by force. And what the picture is, is the picture of a soldier who captures an enemy soldier and puts a spear to his throat and takes him to the, to the prison house. So the scripture is saying here that, that we are the gatekeepers of our mind. Who is the gatekeeper of our mind? Uh, God doesn't... Um, put thoughts and create things in our mind just out of thin air. Um, there are many things that God uh, puts forth to us, but we're the ones. It's our life. We put things into our brain. We are the gatekeepers of what go into our mind. My ears are a gate into my mind. My eyes are a gate into my mind. My uh, sensations, my physical sensations are gates into our mind. And when things enter our mind that begin to argue against what God says and begin to try to establish some stronghold in our life to keep us from knowing God and keep us from serving God, then Paul is saying we must take our spear and put our spear to the neck of that thought and say to that thought, you're not taking me captive, I'm taking you captive. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I love the, this Greek word, obedience, here. Uh, I know anybody that would speak Greek or know Greek would probably cringe at the way I pronounce it, but it's uh, hupakae, the word obedience, hupakae. It's just fun to say. Anyway, that's just something. I, I'm not hard to entertain. Um, but obedience, bring every thought to, into the obedience of Christ. That hupakae means to listen under. It means to be guided by 
someone, like to be mentored or to be to have to listen to someone's uh, speech or control of of your thought, and and it, it goes like this: when any thought enters my eye gate or my ear gate or whatever gate it comes in, that. I'm not going to let that thought enter into my mind without being scrutinized by what God has to say about it. In other words, I'm the gatekeeper of my mind. God has given me the authority to think what I want to think and to let come into my mind what I want to let come into my mind. And he says, it's your responsibility as the gatekeeper of your mind to have everything that comes in through any of those gates scrutinized by the word of God. And so when a thought comes into my mind, I put that thought, I put that thought under Christ and that thought has to listen to what Jesus has to say about that thought. And if Jesus says that thought can stay, then it can stay. And if Jesus says that thought has to go, then it has to go. Now, I know you're thinking, how in the world can I make a thought go away? Because that's one of the problems we have. Now, I've got the answer for you, but it's going to be a point away. So just hang with me, all right? But I want you to see, that's where the battle is. Here's where the battle is. When we think about spiritual battles, we can't see them. We can't see an enemy. We can't take a gun. We can't take a club or a knife. We can't attack an enemy that we can't see. So where is the battle? It's, it's right here. Paul says it's in your mind. That's why your mind has to be transformed. It has to be changed because this is where all the battle between good and evil go on in our life. You change your thoughts, you change your life. Second truth, the word of God is a spiritual weapon. Let me show you. Ephesians 6, very familiar passage of scripture. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And I've said this before. Uh, the word wiles is the Greek word methodia, which we get our word method. So uh, God's telling us that the enemy has a strategy. He has methods. He, he's not haphazard. This is not just something he throws up. He has a strategy. So Put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the methods of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Now, just so you'll get the picture of this, the Apostle Paul is writing the book of Ephesians while he's in prison in Rome. And while he's in prison at Rome, by the way, this will be the end of his life. He will be killed by the Romans. Um, but he's in prison at the time, and he writes several of these epistles. One of them is Ephesians. And he's chained to, to a Roman guard on each, on each hand. And so I'm, I'm imagining him, him saying, okay, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, and he looks over at the guard and he sees the, the weaponry that the guard, the soldier has on. And he sees this giant leather belt around his waist and, and there's a... Uh, what we used to call a scabbard. How's that for an old, old word? A holster, uh, a sheath, and the sword is hanging on the belt. And he, and he, and he notices that. The first thing he notices, and he, and he says, you, you, you need your waist girded with the truth. Now, let me just make an observation here, and I don't, I don't want to get too graphic with any of this, but just to make an observation to you, he's talking about this at lower abdominal area and, and, the, and, and the waist area. Now, there are two primary functions in our lives that happen in this area that alter our life. One is reproduction and the other is elimination of waste. So what the Apostle Paul is saying is that, you're, that you need 
to guard your life and, re, and, and reproduce truth and eliminate error. So if you put on the belt of truth, what you're going to do in life is you're going to reproduce the truth and you're going to eliminate the error. If you don't put on the belt of truth, then you are going to reproduce error and you're going to eliminate the truth out of your life. So it's vital that, that the, the first weapon that he mentions is the girl is a, is a belt of truth. All right, having put on the breastplate of righteousness to go on with it and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, you know, those flaming missiles that Satan shoots at you, those, those devilish thoughts, those enemy assignments that come toward you, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the Bible is the sword of the Spirit, and, and it's the only offensive weapon that we have to fight in this battle. Everything else in this warfare is defensive. I mean, my helmet is defensive, my breastplate's defensive, my shoes are defensive, my shield is defensive. We only have one weapon, one offensive weapon to fight in this war, and that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But that's okay because that's all we need because the Bible, in the spiritual realm, the Bible is nuclear. When, you remember when, when Satan came against Jesus in Matthew 4? The war of all ages was fought in Matthew chapter 4. It was the war between God and Satan. The scripture says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted of the devil. And he was there for 40 days and 40 nights, and after that length of time, the devil came to him and began to challenge him on some things. And I just want to point out to you that the war of all ages was fought in the wilderness here between Jesus and and the devil, and it wasn't fought with bombs, and it wasn't fought with guns, and it wasn't fought with knives or bullets or anything like that. It was fought with the ultimate weapon, words. It was a, a battle that was fought with thoughts. Satan came at Jesus with half-truths and lies. You remember? If you're hungry... Why don't you command these stones to be made bread? Hey, you want to really impress these people? If you want to really impress them, what you need to do is go up to the pinnacle of the temple and just jump off of there. And you know God's not going to let you die and hit the ground and smash on the stones down there. He's got angels that will protect you. Or, hey, look at the kingdoms of the world. If you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms of the world. To which Jesus used three quotes out of the book of Deuteronomy, of all places. The book of Deuteronomy, many people have never even read the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, but he takes the book of Deuteronomy and gives three quotes out of the word of God and destroys the devil right there on the spot. Jesus says, uh, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Sword of the Spirit. Uh, thou shalt not tempt, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Uh, it is written, you shall serve the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And Jesus defeated the devil with three quotes from the word of God. And Paul is saying here, look, you're not battling against people. You're not battling against flesh and blood. You are battling in the spirit realm. And when people become the problem, we have to look beyond flesh and blood to the real battle. And the real battle in our life is always a spiritual battle. So therefore, we must put on the armor of God to fight this battle. 
and we must use the weapons that God has given us to fight this battle. So put on the helmet of salvation so that you can think like a saved person, that your, your thoughts can be like someone who's, who's, who's controlled by the Spirit of God. Uh, put, on your, put over your heart and your chest a breastplate of righteousness. What is righteousness? Right living, right thinking, right acting. Rightness, you're right. You've been saved. The blood of the Lamb has washed you clean. And you have, a, you have the right life. Put that in over all of these vital organs in your life so that Satan can't come in here and, and, and walk in here and tell you that God doesn't love you and God doesn't care about you and, 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 and cloud up your life. Put the truth around your waist so that you are reproducing truth and you're eliminating error in your life. And put on shoes of peace so that that you can take the gospel everywhere, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, and he's with us always. So decide how you're gonna live your life. Your life has a higher purpose than making a buck and spending a buck. Your life is to propagate the gospel, is to spread the kingdom, is to build the kingdom of God. And so God, the Lord gives us the weaponry we need, and the sword of the Spirit is a spiritual weapon. The Bible is a spiritual weapon. The Bible is a thick book, right? You know why it's a thick book? Because God has lots to say. And he has it to say about every area of life. Here's the third truth, and this is the one that'll tell you how to eliminate these thoughts in your mind. Truth number three, meditating on the word of God puts the sword of the spirit into operation. Now don't let that word meditating, I know that's kind of one of those new age kind of words and so forth. Don't let that throw you off. The Bible talks about meditating on it. And I'll show you in just a second. So meditating on the word of God puts the sword of the spirit into operation in your life. We all have areas of life where we have to fight spiritual battles in. I've named some of fear, uh, depression, discouragement, low self-esteem, uh, lust, all the, these kind of things. When we meditate on the word of God, what we are doing is we are placing the word of God into our life and into our mind and allowing it to start doing its work at reprogramming our minds and reprogramming our thoughts, transforming us, if you will. I mean, isn't that what Paul says in Romans 12? Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by working out, uh, spending your money right, uh, living a good life, uh, how are we transformed? By the renewing of our mind that we might prove what is that good except from the perfect will of God. Psalm 1 gives us some instruction. Listen to it, first three verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And listen, last line. And whatever he does shall prosper. It says, everything you do will prosper. Why? Because when you begin to meditate on the word of God, the word of God is the truth. And what does the scripture say? It says that when we come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and he says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. 
and the spirit of truth, he says, will lead us into all things, not just spiritual things, but all things. So the reason someone who meditates on the word of God day and night becomes prosperous is because whatever you need, if you need to understand money, the Holy Spirit will teach you about money. If you need to understand relationships, the Holy Spirit will lead you to truth about relationships. If you need to understand life, whatever it might be, the Holy Spirit will lead you to that truth because the Holy Spirit leads us to all truth. And when we begin to meditate on the Word of God, we begin to succeed because strongholds and arguments in our life that have been holding us in bondage and robbing from us in life begin to fall and God begins to build strongholds of truth in our life and, and, and in our minds. And I can say to you today that I am a totally different person than I used to be. You know why? Because of the way, because of the way I think. You say, Pastor, how, you know, how does my life change? I mean, my life is pitiful. I, I, it's unsuccessful. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's haphazard. It's, it, it's, it's, it's full of anxiety and tension and strife and division. How does my life change? Your life changes by the way you think. If you want to change your life, you have to change the way you think. God's word, the sword of the spirit, the spirit of truth has made, has made me free. It makes you free. Now, I'm not 100% perfect by any means, but I am a whole lot different than I used to be because the word of God has set me free. Now, let me give you the process of, of biblical meditation. This is how you do it. It's really simple, and it's not some spiritually weird kind of thing. Here's how you do it. Number one. Wake up in the morning and read what you need. Um, and like I said, don't make this some kind of spiritual uh, religious exercise. I mean, just, just keep it real. Uh, what is it you need? What is it that's bothering you? I mean, are you discouraged? Uh, are you fearful? Are you stressed out? You're full of anxiety? Uh, you, you're worried about life? Uh, you got some arguments and disagreements? You know, I mean, what is it? You worried about money? Uh, what is it that you're worried about? When you wake up in the morning, all right, I'm worried about this. And you can go, any Christian bookstore has shelves full of books that have all areas of life broken down and passages of scripture that goes with them. I mean, bunches of passages of scripture that go with them. Or just, you know, that little computer you have that knows everything in the world, just type in verses about fear, Bible verses about fear, and it'll pull up many verses. And so it's not difficult, I'm telling you, to find verses that God's word says about whatever it is that's bothering you. So wake up in the morning and read what you need. Secondly, bring it up throughout the day. When you get it and you read it, don't just read it in the morning and walk away from it. Bring it up throughout the day. Think about, med I mean, we're talking about meditating on something. We're talking about, about uh, uh, focusing on this thing. We're talking about looking for these things. And so as your day begins to go by, what you read it, out of the Bible that morning, look for it in life. And when it happens in life, talk about it. Let me, let me show you. This is, uh, this is Deuteronomy 6, verse six, starting at verse 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So what's the instruction here? 
teach your children. And I think the implication is, you don't have any children, teach yourself. If you have children, teach yourself and your children. Teach these things that you read to your children or to yourself or both when you are sitting in your house, when you're going somewhere, when you're riding in an automobile or walking however you're getting while you're going somewhere, when you're lying in bed at night before you go to sleep, and when you wake up in the morning, just after you wake up, meditate on these things, think on these things, talk about these things, illustrate these things, show these things. I mean, why did God tell Israel to do that in these four times of the day? Well, because these are the most meditative times of the day. And also, if we admit it, these are probably the, the most often times in our life where we have thought problems in those times of our day. So bring it up during the day. Uh, talk about it. Uh, remember, it's not a sin to be tempted. You can't, uh, the old illustration is you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, which is absolutely true, but you can keep him from building a nest on your head. So just to be tempted to have a thought pass through your mind doesn't mean that you've sinned. I mean, it could be a thought by the devil fired through there, or it could be something out of your own heart fired through there, but it's not a sin to be tempted. It is a sin if you stop and meditate on that and allow that thing to grow in your life. So let the word of God speak to you, notice it during the day, bring it up throughout the day, and it's not lost to you. If you just read it in the morning, you're just gonna go your way and it's not gonna really matter to you. Uh, it, it'll just be something that you forget about. But if you'll bring that thing up through the day and allow the Lord to continue speaking to you about it, and look, when you notice something, uh, teach it, talk to it, talk about it to somebody. Come home and say, hon, do you know what? I read this verse this morning and here's what happened today. Or you're talking with your children. It, it, you, just, you, just, you just have to place it in your life and allow it to keep feeding into your life and to keep talking about those things. All right, here's the third thing. Um, replace lesser thoughts with a greater one. When I'm in a, a meditative moment, uh, I load scriptures into my mind and, and I begin to meditate on those scriptures. All right, here's what I've noticed. You can't take a thought out of your mind. The more you try to take it out of your mind, the more you think about it. What you have to do is you have to replace the thought with a greater one. Let me give you an example. You've heard me talk about the yellow elephant before, right? Now, I want you to picture a yellow elephant. Got a long yellow trunk, got big yellow elephant ears. He's a yellow elephant. All right, now, you got him, you see him? All right, now, forget him. Don't think about the yellow elephant. No, don't think about it. Oh, not even a little bit. Get that yellow elephant out of your mind and don't even think about him. Don't see his yellow ears or his yellow, just don't even think about him at all. All right, that's pretty much impossible, right? That yellow elephant, I'm still seeing him right now in my mind. But now, if we introduce a red dog, hey, think about your favorite type of dog and think about him being red. A red dog, a red hairy dog. Look, Harry's got a red shirt on. He's red hairy dog. <laughs> Think about a red dog. Now, you're not thinking about a yellow elephant anymore, are you? I mean, that's just a simple little concept. That's, that's the concept of the thing, you know. Where some people, and some people try to use willpower to fight these battles. And the only trouble with willpower is that it eventually runs out. And we know this. Uh, we know that... It, the big things in our life can't be affected by willpower. Now, I'm not against willpower, and I'm not saying that having some obedience and having some discipline in your life is not a good thing. It is a good thing. But you're not going to be able to conquer these gigantic areas in your life that are battlefields and spiritual battlefields in your life by simple willpower. Because willpower is like what? A rubber band? Have you ever gotten a rubber band and maybe you got a pencil? Maybe, I don't know, if, when you were a child, if you did this... 
you got a pencil, put it in a rubber band, hold it, and then you start wrapping the pencil like this. And then you let it go and it goes like a propeller. Well, you keep on, you do it again. Well, eventually you're gonna, you're gonna wrap it and you're gonna keep on wrapping, 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 wrapping. And, and, and eventually what's gonna happen to the rubber band? It's gonna break, right? Too much stress, too much tension, too much power. Eventually, and see, this is what happens in life. This is what happens with our willpower. It, it looks good at first, but it, it just runs out. So let me ask you, let me mention what you should do or what we can do about this. In the scripture, the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit comes to live in our life, that he brings some things. The Bible calls it in the book of Galatians, chapter five, the fruit of the Spirit. And what are these fruit of the Spirit? There are nine of them that are mentioned. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and and what's the last one? Self-control. So the Holy Spirit brings self-control into our life. So when we need self-control instead of trying to willpower it ourselves, we should say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I I need self-control. I need for you to work self-control in this part of my life and and put some dependence on on the Holy Spirit in your life to do the work that you can't do. And when the devil attacks your mind, you have your mind loaded with the scripture of whatever he's attacking you with. Look, I have had many battles in in, in my life and still do. And I can tell you that the, the word of God has been the answer to these attacks so many times, it's unbelievable but you can't call the word of God out of you if you haven't put it in you. I can't, I can't ever remember, and, and I'm, I mean, I, I, I just can't ever remember a time where God just gave me something totally out of the thin blue air uh, when I was being attacked or when I, I needed it to, to, to put an issue forth. I, I can't remember God just saying, hey, look, I know you had a hard week this week. I know it's been really busy and you haven't had really time to study my word or put any in there, but I know you're gonna need this. So I'm just gonna give it to you without you having to do anything. You just hear it and here it is. I've never had that happen in my life. It's always been something that's in there that he draws out, that he moves out of your life. You have to engage. You have to get in the fight, get in the battle, and God will work those works in your life. And that's the way he changes our mind. So bow your head with me for one moment, if you would. Please.